I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. I am uh, conversing with uh, Haris Shekeris, a Math for Wisdom participant. Uh, you know him from the parties after talks. Uh, and you know him from discussion group emails. And so I will be uh, asking him to tell me and you about his relationship with truth and the activities he'd like uh, at Math for Wisdom, the questions he'd like to investigate. Welcome, Harris. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for having me. And hopefully, hopefully we'll stick around quite a long time and learn from each other and support each other. I'm really looking forward to that. With all the rest, of course, it's not only personal, but thanks to you for animating the community anyway for starting it. So, yeah. So uh, I, I asked this, uh, I've, I've learned to ask this uh, because I, one of the things I've realized with Math for Wisdom is that uh, I want absolute truth. Uh, I am fostering this investigatory community for absolute truth, but that's not typically where anybody else is coming from. So I learned I need to ask people about uh, their relationships with truth. So I ask you, what is your relationship with truth? So, well... Well, my stated position, I guess, is I am a truth relativist. I have uh, experience both in, let's say, in philosophy, but mostly in sociology and history, that the ways of humans change both horizontally in time, so across in the same timeline across different cultures, and in um in and vertically in time so in different times there's different things that are taken to be true and also what is taken the meaning of the concept or of the word if you want of the concept let's say changes in time as well now there's also of course two considerations in that that would i would like to qualify that so in that sense i would like to be clear in an external, uh, as an external observation, I'd say I only see relative truth. Now, it would be great if there was absolute truth. It would be really great if, you know, there was um, somehow all the people agreed on many things. I mean, you know, one standard example is that, well, we don't even agree if we, one plus one equals two. If you go in the quantum world, then one plus one equals, so no, no in the quantum world, in the relat relativity theory, one plus one equals 1.98 mass, if you add mass plus one mass. Mm -hmm. So, and what, and famously Bertrand Russell did his one plus one equals two. He spent a couple of, you know, volumes trying to prove that and then group theory came along and smashed everything up. On the other hand, um, I some two things that resonate with me. Uh, one is that, um, you know, there are things which say, for example, Orthodox Christianity says God is truth, which I always found like an interesting idea. Of course, something that goes against um, math for wisdom is that we cannot know, at least according to me, our brains are a lot more limited than God's brain. So there is a big block there, which I am aware that uh, math for wisdom goes in another way on this. Uh, we can discuss this later. Um, the other thing which was a big newer for me is uh, an encounter that I had a, uh, a month ago or two months ago, where an esteemed friend of mine said, you know, Harris, truth cannot be known. Truth, truth, I, the gist of what he was saying is like, truth is not the sort of thing that can be known. Truth is the sort of thing that can be felt. And that observation or that piece of wisdom, which came from a person who didn't have many academic credentials or anything, it was like a Anyway, well, it was a teacher. It wasn't an, anybody with credentials. That has 
shaken me a lot. And if I may add, another thing that shook me, for example, that goes against my absolute, my relativist truth is, for example, so to lay out an example of how, of the dilemmas that I'm in, you, um, you have, or you see in history, for example, that in 1963 and 1964, some, um, some Greek Cypriots or, okay, one truth that we learn at school is that the Turkish Cypriots walked out of the Republic of Cyprus in 1963. Of course, what we don't learn is that in 1963, the Greek Cypriots tried to actively, um, or the leadership, or some part of the leadership, tried to actually massacre the Greek Cypriots. Now, that's one episode where you've got two different versions of history, which will deeply resonate, and time will show which one will prevail. However, if you go, and this can go either for Greek Cypriots or Turkish Cypriots, if you go to the um, anthropological laboratory where they identify the missing people, you will find skulls with holes in them, which means somebody was at the end of the gun. We don't know who it was, but somebody, and that's where my relativism hits a bit of a, like, you know, comes at a, hits a brick wall in a way. Somebody was at the end of the gun, was holding the gun, and somebody shot with the gun. For whatever reason, I don't know. History might tell or whatever, but that's my brick wall. There is a skull with a hole in it, mm. which they didn't slip down and just, you know, just slip down the toilet or something. So these are my dilemmas. As I said, I'm repeating myself. Sometimes I really wish that there was an absolute truth. My experience, I'll try to wrap up what I said. My experience to, large, to a large extent shows that there are real contradictions and that there are contingencies. Another major thing is contingency. So not if I will take absolute truth, it's a contingent absolute truth. I don't know if that works. I haven't thought about it, to be honest, but contingency was my master's thesis, mm -hmm. contingentism in science, whether things could be different in science. And um this brick wall with things that you have to admit that something happened we might not know what happened but something happened but i don't know how much that you know whether the absolute truth seeker is satisfied with this something happened i don't know well that's not my problem maybe so first of all uh setting aside absolute truth uh, but uh just uh feeling you know into my role as investigator you know and i'm looking at you as my data right so so i have to yeah. so i have to be respectful to my data and you know try to understand you know not to invent the data points but to record data points mm -hmm. and so trying to listen to you understand you as best as i can and be open to surprise and be open to knowledge so you're talking about uh, truth in a personal way I think a little bit scattered, you know, in the sense that a little bit impressionistic. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's like I see flickering lights, but I'm trying to see, like, is it possible for me to kind of make some, some kind of sense of it? Uh, what can... is it? So if we review, you know, like if or if you review, what is it that you're saying about your relationship with truth? Uh, what is truth or what is that relationship? Um, do you mean in a more formal, like, in an ism, should I put it in a more in more? Well, just I think more just in terms of um, uh, what is what are you? What is the truth not, that you're talking about? You know, like what is uh, what 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 are you talking about? Maybe think more just in a um, truth of history, because I believe that uh, well, truth, even ultimate truth, what you name them. That's why I'm asking, you know, because... Ah, okay, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, um, ultimate truths, proximate truths, distal truths, like truths of history, truths of science, very limited because I'm mostly historicist and historicist about science, about, sorry, about 
truth, I would be as well as I said before. Uh, there's something called not historical semantics, what was it? Semantic drift or something that I I heard yesterday that in linguistics is would describe that. I would apply that to truth as well. That the content the the because uh so my semantics, which it would include truth. Uh, would be that um, the meanings of words are um, arrays of examples which are changing all the time. So the meaning of true of the word truth or what is or something is true or is not true, it changes through time. So I'm trying. What is my relationship? And does that and does that does that mean Go that on. the I'm sorry. Does that mean that the truth changes through time, or does that the meaning changes through time? Um, strictly speaking, what I said is that the meaning of what it what it means for some some uh, proposition to be true changes through time. So it's not the case that propositions have or all propositions, even like you know, salt dissolves in water, for example. That all these propositions they don't have fixed um, fixed value fixed truth value because it might come like you know if for example I mean it might be a Latourian for example that uh, before two thousand years ago for example if we had if somebody said salt dissolves in water or if you go to another edge of the universe for whatever reason if they're aliens if they don't have salt then it doesn't have a truth value. Or there might be, you know, other contingent factors. There might not be any salt. The atmosphere might be different. The laws of physics might be different. So if I if and I was to, if I was to summarize oh. what I'm hearing, you know, and I'll say it because you can, as a starting point, you correct it. But you're describing for you that truth is a judgment within a context. So, um, or maybe even a correct judgment within a context. You know that. Uh, I would say, yeah, I would accept correct, but correctness, I will uh, I will have a community. So that's my communitarianism, which I may have mentioned elsewhere. We didn't mm -hmm. talk about this yesterday, today, but so um, the, the, if you want, in the absence of truth, Oh, sorry, if you want, in the absence of God being the truth maker, mm -hmm. the con or the context, what decides the context or the correctness, sorry, the correctness of the context, what decides the correctness is a community of speakers. So does that make sense? Well, so just to peel this apart a little bit, first of all, uh, it is about some kind of judgment, you know, proposition, or it's a judgment about some kind of proposition. And then... Uh... Um, judgment, I'm not too sure. I wouldn't, I would shy away from using that word because I don't know it that much and well, we're getting recorded. I'd rather not use things well, that so I, I haven't grown it, into. Just there's what so I mean. many ways to talk so about much. truth. Well, maybe let, uh, we won't say this is your view. I'll just say that but this is what I'm this is what I'm putting together, you know. So this is not okay. you, but this is me putting it together. I'd say we're talking about propositions. We're saying those propositions are in a context that uh, in that context they can have a certain meaning. Uh, and then um there's an evaluation of those propositions. That evaluation can be correct or not correct. Uh, the correctness not correct the correctness continue so you see so first of all there's a context with regards to meaning there's a second context with regard to correctness you see there's maybe like a third context uh or you know which number them as you prefer but there's another context with regard to like you said the community of speakers you know like there's some kind of sanction you know it's it is an audience for this basically like so no so there's all no, no, so how many contexts like are there mm -hmm. there's only one there's only one or maximum two mm -hmm. there's at the end of the day there's only a community of speakers and the community of speakers will be those who let's say um like if we're talking about let's say a proposition understand the proposition, who agree on what the proposition 
um, mm -hmm. meaning. And then within, so there's this community, and then there's a proposition. Okay, so a horse is what that horse is white. I don't know, like I don't know, Alexander the Great's horse was white, whatever. Okay, then there's for me there's um uh, there's first um a community of speeches which understands. So no, actually no. The only thing that happens, the only thing that happens then that we get out and which is important is that we get the behavior. Some people will say, yes, the horse was white. Others will say, no, it wasn't white. Okay. And um, then whether this is a fact of the matter, so whether it's correct or context or whatever, or you can introduce context, but I wouldn't because I think it unnecessarily complicates things. Then one perhaps of the two, um, either it's white or it's not white, will prevail for whatever reason, because it wasn't, you know, maybe because it wasn't like it didn't have the color, maybe because so-and-so said so, maybe because of one forces, for whatever reason. And all the other, or it wasn't, it's not white, it might prevail the other one. That becomes the truth of the fact of the matter. So if I, if I, if I said it like this, like truth is the prevailing understanding. Um, I could agree with that. Um, I should, by the way, I'm not sure whether, no, I won't mention the name. Anyway, I mean, mm -hmm. there might be a philosopher. I wasn't, I was following a philosopher, to that, but I might be distorting this with my body against me. So maybe better not to mention him now. Uh, so Martin, wherever you are, hello. Anyway, he's alive, don't worry. But okay. uh, so um, prevailing understanding. Um, yeah, I would write with that. I would write with that to a certain extent, maybe. I might need to think about it a bit more, well, but, and, mm -hmm. you know, to qualify it. But remember that there's more than one community. So, and there's there's various contingencies for why, think, why people agree to something. Well, and so, okay. example, um, a couple of examples. I was in Turkey, and uh, I was uh, looking for a Lithuanian uh, young woman there. And um, mm -hmm. the the person told me, oh, you mean the blonde woman, you see. Now, in Lithuania, she would never be considered blonde. Her hair is brown, you see, and kind of like a dark yeah. brown, you see. But because it's not black, you see, it's considered blonde. Yeah. And I think, but it took me, it didn't register with me. I thought we were talking, it couldn't be the same person. Then later, I kind of started to realize that's the yeah. prevailing understanding in Turkey. Yeah, wait, yeah. wait till so, you get into the intricacies of, of the coffee, of Cypriot coffee, Greek coffee, Turkish coffee, mm -hmm. uh, Syrian coffee, Lebanese coffee, Israeli coffee. They mean the same thing, perhaps. It's just that it's not, not, not espresso. Yet, even if you go to any country, they'll say, you know, Cypriot coffee or Greek coffee or Turkish coffee, like our coffee. Well, or like and you, you know, mentioned, it has to do... you mentioned Alexander's yeah. white horse. And if we were able to go back in time, all of a sudden the word white might not be appropriate for different cultures because they would say yeah. that's not white, that's uh, beige or that's, yeah. you know, whatever it is, right? Yeah. Like, you know, but you imagine white in your own way. So, yeah. um, and so a lot of the differences between nations, uh, you can see, you know, whether it's Ukraine and Russia or, you know, whoever, but you'll see this divergence where like the prevailing understanding is made uh, different. And so yeah. basically the same thing, you know, like, like Bosnian, Croatian and Serbian as languages, yeah. you know, it's like you're like with your coffees, you know, it's like, well, yeah. Object, yeah. you know, so there's an objective um, in, in the, the quote unquote objective truth would be an outsider's truth, which would be their prevailing truth. You know, I mean, their prevailing understanding. So, but the point is, is that you you have prevailing understandings, and in the community that you're in, there's going to be different understandings uh, based on that yeah. community. 
yeah, yeah. You can see that like in the emails that you're sending, you've already you already show that like for example, with uh, you know, to, because sometimes with the outside and objective truth of the ex outside ex um, uh, outside uh, observer, sorry. And this you can see, I actually wrote about this in the context of science. It was an observation, something called science, uh, sorry, distance lens enchantment, which was an observation by the sociologist of uh, scientific knowledge, uh, Harry Collins mm -hmm. in the 70s. And I reinterpreted that according to made it according to communitarian epistemology, which is which is my influence. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, so what Collins observed was that the further away you are from the site of the production of a scientific claim, the more certain you are about its truth. Because a lot of the oh. uncertainties and the complications, they wash themselves out. Then that well, I they don't get reported. I mean, they, write... they, they, they fall away, right? Like, they... Yeah, yeah, they fall away. And I noticed that, for example, in your letters, when you describe the situation in your region, in Russia and, you know, about these things. You know about Kiev being the capital of Russia or Kosovo today, like the capital of Serbia. Yeah. Uh, you know things like that. But what I wanted to say before, uh, what I wanted to distance myself from when you mentioned the context, is there is this philosopher called Ian Hacking, who came close to the relativist but uh, shied away because he said he wanted more or less to say that. If you understand the sentence, there is a truth value. And I want to this, there's no sort of, or you might not know it, but there is one. There is something correct and something incorrect if you understand what's going on, like in the sentence. I want to eliminate that. The, I, I need to keep the ambiguity, the, you so, know, the, so that, the that, that statement, I mean, that expression, the prevailing understanding, uh, does that by kind of saying, all the contextual issues have been kind of like all the subtleties have been erased. Like there's one overriding context, which is the community that, you know, and the way it looks at it, the way it kind of like approves it or the way it decides is the context. I mean, there's no other issue to worry about. Uh, there's no, there's no like objective. I mean, there's no context of discourse. There's no context of objective reality. Like there's just basically like, it's all basically a convention. Uh, yeah, the dominant, okay. I would, the dominant I would agree uh, understanding in that convention. Is that? I will agree a lot with like conventions. I would be okay with them. Maybe not too much, but I haven't. Too, I haven't studied too much convention because there is an ism with conventions, and I want to be careful. Given that we're recording, I want. So, to and, and maybe though. just to just to understand like what's this for? Because this is like a shorthand for me to inhabit. You know, to be able like to reduce your position to a sh an acceptable shorthand to say, well, this is the starting point, I understand you. So the example being that I have uh, in the video, uh, Welcome to Math for Wisdom, as you probably saw, uh, there's uh, eight people and they all have different uh, shortcuts, you know, like, so John Brett says truth is a metaphor, right? And of course, it's got to be more complicated than that. But Or uh, uh, Kirby Erner says, well, truth is a defensive strategy, right? Or John Harlan says truth is a difficult path. And it's a summary, you know, it can't be everything what they mean by it, but it's just fascinating that it's so different. Uh, and so one of the things I'm trying to do now is to, because my insight like truth is an absolute view. So, uh, and kind of like what Kirby Erner said in an email uh, today that, uh, well, he's uh, looking at the wondrous wisdom of, you know, that I'm trying to communicate uh, that I'm saying there's this language we could be fluent in that would allow us to share absolute truth. But but that's a worldview. So there can be a worldview based on that, uh, but there can be a worldview based on prevailing understanding. You know, like there can be a worldview based on, on a difficult path, you know, or, uh, but, and so my interest is how to show how these different worldviews could be um, related in a meaningful, helpful way. Yeah, I mean, worldviews are more into my ballpark because they also encompass epistemic, they're more, they're bigger, they're richer epistemic, you know, they don't only revolve around truth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the relativist likes likes worldviews. Likes, you know, he, he only goes, there's more than one. 
and you know every very standard right uh you know literature for example Fireburn wrote about this Martin wrote about this as well in a way or in answering to Bogosian is this like you know there's the there's the scientific worldview and the and the religion worldview and their encounter is Galileo with Bellarmine with uh, Bishop Bellarmine mm -hmm. uh, you know about whether the earth was moving Oh. And they have this, and there is this nice discussion. It's two little books, or oh, like, you know, it's one book by Bogosian who tries to argue against relativism, and then Martin uh, responds to him. Um, so, and there is, it, it is, so the worldviews is something that I can talk a lot about, like that I like, let's put it this way. But I, I hasten to add that they are. Uh, epistemic frameworks. They generate knowledge. They don't just generate. They don't generate truth. They generate right. knowledge. Where in the epistemic, you know, I mean, this might be or the last, let's say, 50, 60, 70, 80 years is the age of epistemology. It wasn't always so, you know, in academia, let's say, which you might or may not like or have a broader or narrower view, but. This is my impression that the, a lot, ha it's the buzzword, like epistemology here, epistemology there. So worldviews are generative of, you know, they they generate knowledge, you know? And my work is also comes mostly from knowledge of truth rather than absolute truth, rather than truth, sorry, rather than what truth is, is like a more pertinent question would be, how can I know truth? Do you see what I mean? Or do I know truth? Rather, like this is closest to what I've done, like where I feel more at home. With and and more just to add for our audience that uh, you have a PhD in philosophy, you wrote a thesis in uh, and master's uh, work in. Uh, in... Uh, yes, I I did my master's thesis on contingentism in science, which is whether uh, with different like through the ages that there, there can be different ontologies. So in science, so for example, that we have atoms now and in 50, and we know that we say there are atoms and we don't, it's not, we know that there are atoms, there are atoms. And then in, um, I don't know, a hundred years or for aliens or whatever, there could be a different history of science that leads mm. to there not being any atoms. That's right, that was my possible. master's thesis. Yeah, that was my master's thesis because you know the the opposite thesis you cannot imagine it is necessary. If there are atoms, there there always it, are it atoms. Could, it could turn out that atoms, atoms is a pretty nonsensical way to look at it. Doesn't really not a very helpful way to yeah, look yeah, at it. Yeah, yeah, but that's but, you know two hundred years from now, was, let's say, right? Like yeah. Yeah, yeah, but the thing is, with we play with different trajectories of science and whether these could be real. That was my master's. Then in uh, my PhD, I tackled the problem of uh, scientists um, playing a large role in uh, in science in in policy within the context of a democratic society. And the view that I took was more or less, even though I wasn't that much aware of, um, so what was that, um, David Moore? The Watchers. I wasn't that much aware of the, the who, who watches the Watchmen, the Watchmen, not the Watchers. The Watchmen, it was more or less sort of who watches the Watchmen, sort of with the, with the scientists, who can criticize the scientists? And I was led into commentarian epistemology. And I discussed, at the end, I discussed um, uh, sustainability science as an example of communitarian epistemology. And then I participated uh, for in a two year, uh, for two years, I, participated, I did some postdoc work. Uh, on a project called Democracy with SCI as in science at the end, which was again uh, about to what extent and how should lay people be involved in determining the agenda of scientific research. Um, and so to jump in, um, to say, first of all, like in it's very interesting for me that this idea of like 
a prevailing understanding it's a theme in your scientific work and then like the watchers of the of the watchmen let's say like the what the prevailing understanding of the prevailing understanding could mean you know like how does you know so how do different contexts for that shake out um that seems to the natural that seems to be like natural issues that arise like from this type of uh uh worldview so what I'd like to ask uh, in the time we have left is to uh, before, before, is what what before, uh, before we move forward, I'll, I'll try to be really quick. One really key focus that might not have shown through this is democracy and democratic control. I'm really interested mm -hmm. in political philosophy and this question of checking and you know not having you know. Knowledge has to be something which is graspable. Otherwise you get political problems. You get class who want to rule and experts who might not be justified. That's what and so, I... So that's what I wanted to ask in like, because I'm very glad that you're in Wet Math for Wisdom. And the question for me is like, well, how could this be an investigatory community? So what types of questions would you like to investigate? What could those investigations look like? Um. I'm always happy, and to be honest, because I had been distant from the, the contours of the philosophy seminar, so I'm always happy to be there mm -hmm. and to absorb things and to just participate in talks where I don't understand much or I test my understanding by asking questions and seeing how silly they sound. But, uh, so what I would want would be this idea, because as you know, I've done some, I've got some uh, writing, some recent writings. This is a part where I advertise myself on ResearchGate, if you look at the name that you've mm -hmm. got up there. Um, some recent writings, which are on numbers. Uh, they might be not so good quality or obvious or whatever. I don't know. You, you be the judge of it. And please leave a comment. But... Um, what I would like, for example, my project would be to popularize this and see if it can be graspable, if you mm -hmm. want, like my agenda, if you want, or then be a contrarian and, and argue that, look, if it cannot be grasped easily, then that says something about its mind of God or something. I mean, sometimes I have this, because I know Math for Wisdom talks about God sometimes, I and I wrote this in a poem that, Sometimes I have this idea that God is just a little point or a little amoeba or less than an amoeba, a little point, because everything because it doesn't need any everything else, mm -hmm. and it understands everything else, so it doesn't need need anymore the outside world, mm -hmm. as opposed to the big father with a beard or whatever that right. decides the rules of the universe. So that's could be my agenda for example simplifying things for example in one of in the after party i think it was i'm not sure if it was recorded where i tried to say look guys i think i've understood a bit of this category theory and it's all it is is just putting my geometry into an upper level and mm -hmm. making it a bit more complicated I, I don't remember if you remember that episode it was towards the end where i said look guys I'm surprised to say that I've done category theory because I was doing it in terms of my little mm -hmm. radius, radii or whatever, radii, term, right term in Latin, like radiuses, you know, like half, you know. So I could turn that into a project. I'm not too, well, I don't so mind how, not how would you it. How would you phrase your project as a question? Um, that you don't know the answer to, right? Like what's a question? That I, I'll let me give me. I hope that I'll not take more than 50 seconds on this. Let me think. Um, okay, here's something that I don't know the question, the answer to. Are all, let's put it for humans first, are and ought we think of all humans are as equals? in a very deep epistemic sense. Mm -hmm. I mean every single fucking word and I will use right. the word fucking. Right. There's like fucking equal. 
like really, well, that's, really that would be like, like a you know. thesis that I have, you know, and it's of course a very uh, consequential in the sense that you know, people, there's, I mean, people's minds are all over the place, and not just people, you know, but you can have, of course, other animals or beings or whatever. And mm -hmm. to go well, back we can to go the to animals as well, we can go to animals as well. I just, just to give an example based on, start. yeah, with regard to your prevailing understanding, right? Like. If you look at the model for the landscape of truth I, I'm looking at, is that truth in general, uh, in the different things people are saying, it's this um, concordance between like a mind that knows and a mind that does not know but asks questions. I can, you know, and so this mind that knows, like it's feeding through emotion, like, hey, like it's feeding information, and the other mind is trying to model it. There's a third mind that decides when they're at agreement, you know, kind of like says okay it punctuates it says okay this is a complete sentence or this is the this is a sound idea or whatever it is so that third mind is what i think you're calling that prevailing understanding like you know it's it's the spoken community that i'm just saying from my point of view now that can be internal it could be some kind of internal community in a person you know in any system mm -hmm. but what it's doing it's kind of sanctioning different things it's saying okay this is sanctioned you know this is sanctioned this is sanctioned and so that's the creation of knowledge, you know, the production of knowledge in a certain sense. So that's kind of like my summary of understanding of what you're saying. I, I really like that. I really like that as long as they function as a triad. So maybe there's interesting words so, that and you so might there's find this, in my... Like, these different uh, types of context find... come up. And also like with truth, people are usually talking about, you're not, but usually they're talking about truth at different levels. See, yours is very universal in the sense that mm. you're saying, hey, truth is being created. I mean, like or knowledge is being created and truth is. I think uh, Patreon support for math for wisdom is a great way to contribute to this project. I think anybody who joins math for wisdom is probably thinking the same as I am on the subject and Patreon is such an easy thing to use for its support of different things like Math for Wisdom. Uh, it's a no-brainer. A few, few bucks a month, no problem. We have a minute left and I would just want to ask uh, if you, creatively uh, you end us with a prayer, you know, that uh, because just to thank God for giving us the seriousness of. of can uh, I shamelessly? Schools. Can I shamelessly um, advertise myself? Before yes, I that's a fair prayer. prayer. Um, so yeah, I mean this. Um, as long as I said, as long as the three minds we can reconcile us our views, as long as we are, um, as long as we feel, think of them as a unit, as a tripartite unit. And that might be relevant to what I wrote in that scramble that I wrote in ResearchGate. So let's go to the prayer now. So thank, uh, thank you, God or whatever higher or goddesses or council of gods or Rastafari for bringing me and Andrews together. Thank you, Marcus and Marianne for supporting and every body that I support, which I don't have time to support now. And please, God, let us always have such a good time discussing things and being 